Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to worship here at First Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. What a joy it is for us to gather together for worship on this one day out of seven set apart for worship and for rest. If you're a visitor here this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you joined us for worship. We hope that you will join us again in the future. And if you're visiting with us and you've never filled out one of our visitor sheets, we'd love for you to do that and place it in the offering plate later just so we can welcome you and answer any questions that you might have about the church. If you're watching online via the live stream, we are thankful for technology and glad that we uh, can, can benefit from that. Several announcements before we begin our service. First is that this Wednesday is our final Foundations for the Faith for the uh, 20, year 2023. Uh, we'll begin again in January on the 10th, I believe, but uh, we'll have dinner at 5.30 and programming for all ages at 6.15. Even if you haven't normally been coming, we'd invite you to that. Our kids, elementary school kids, are going to have a birthday party for Jesus, uh, and it's going to be a wonderful time. So again, that's our final foundations for the year. This coming Saturday is our uh, men's monthly Bible study. That meets at 7 o'clock in Robinson Hall. Uh, men, I would invite you to that. It's a wonderful time of fellowship, time of study and prayer together. And it really is a wonderful time. Next Sunday, during this, each service, our uh, newly elected elders and deacons will be in, ordained and installed to that office, and so I hope that you'll be here and that you'll be in prayer for those new officers, and uh, that afternoon at 2 p.m. will be the second part of the training for our elders and deacons, and so I hope that all the elected officers will plan to be there uh, if you're coming on or whether you've served for, uh, before or not. Uh, and even if you aren't a newly elected officer and you want to know more about leadership in the life of the church, you are welcome to attend us from 2 to 4 p.m. next Sunday in the faith room uh, here at the church. Operation Christmas Child boxes are also due back next Sunday. If you've taken a box, or there are some still, if you haven't gotten one in the connector, go pack a box. Uh, you can take your children, your grandchildren to do that and uh, bring it back and it'll be shipped all around the world to be a blessing to a child in another country. Lessons and Carols is December the 17th. That's two weeks away. I hope that you will plan to be here if you're in town. And it's also a wonderful opportunity to invite people to church, especially folks who don't have a church home. It's a wonderful time focusing on the birth of Christ through the reading of Scripture and through uh, singing praises to God and wonderful Christmas hymns. Uh, so I hope that you will come and that you will invite people to that service. On Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve is a Sunday this year, and so we'll have one service in the morning, 10 a.m., no Sunday school, and we'll have our regular Christmas Eve services, 3 p.m., which is a family and just joy service, and then our 5 p.m. and our 9 p.m. candlelight services. So if you're in town and you have family in town, I hope that you'll come and worship on Christmas Eve. As always, see the bulletin, the weekly email, the newsletter for all the announcements of things going on in the life of a church. Several folks to be praying for. First, Angela Fischer continues under hospice care, and she is doing about the same. Continue to pray for her, that the Lord will provide for her and her family. Mardell Nashen, who is one of our newer members, uh, is under hospice care uh, and is not long for this world. Uh, I'm not sure when the Lord will call her home, but it may be any day now. So do be in prayer uh, for her. And lastly, three praises. All surgeries of this last week went really well. Uh, Mary Robinson, Stephen Turner, and Michelle Harbin all did well. And I will praise the Lord for that and continue to pray that recovery would go smoothly for them and that they would uh, be able to make good progress as time goes on. Well, today marks the beginning of Advent. And you see a list in your bulletin, the lighting of the Advent wreath, and Tim and Nancy Templeton are going to come and lead us in that, the reading of Scripture and lighting of the candle. Good morning. We will be lighting the prophecy candle this morning, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. But first, hear the word of God from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, 
as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. As Nancy just read, the prophet Isaiah told of the coming Messiah whom God would send to lead his people. For many years, the people waited and looked forward to the coming of the promised one. As we begin the season of Advent, we are reminded in the many ways God fulfills his promises to us and is faithful. We look forward to the joy of Christmas as we make plans in our homes and our church for this celebration. The prophecy candle reminds us that Christmas is coming and honors those who first spoke and believed in the promise of the coming Christ child. call to worship this morning is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 25 verse 9. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Our professional hymn of praise is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Hymn book number 147, if you're able, please stand and sing.
us pray. Father God, as we gather today in your house, we acknowledge that you know our thoughts and needs before we even have them, because you are the Alpha and the Omega. You know the beginning and the end, because you ordained all our days according to your plan. As we come to praise and worship you today, we give you thanks for the abundance of ways you have blessed us. Thank you for being approachable, dependable, merciful, and prov providing for us in ways seen and unseen. Thank you most of all for loving us so much that you, that you sent your son Jesus into this world as a holy and blameless sacrifice to suffer on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Even after all you've done for us, we continue to sin against you. We continue to put our own desires above the needs of others and ignore your command to love one another. We falsely build ourselves up by belittling others. We attempt to rely on our own power and understanding instead of the wisdom that only comes from you. Replace our sinful thoughts with the true understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Open our hearts and minds to your message today and hear us as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our assurance of pardon is found in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Please be seated.
Our first reading this morning is Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 17. <clears throat> Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Thanks, Max. We come now to the time in our service. We give back to the Lord his tithes and our offerings. Remember, this is an act of worship. We want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So let's do that now by giving back to him his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithful provision and how you have blessed us with all that we have and all that we are. We want to take these gifts, use them for your good purposes, for the advancement of your kingdom and the spread of the good news of the gospel. So the knowledge of you may cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We pray this in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. This time I want to invite forward our kids, it's kids fifth grade and younger, to come to the front for our children's message and Elijah is going to lead that for us. It's a boy. Uh, there's a child, or um, that, that is really good news. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's something a little bit smaller. After church, your parents go, we're going to go get ice cream, or we're going to Disney World. Right. Is that exciting to you guys? No, not, not today. That's all right. Well, 
every once in a while you receive news that changes everything, kind of like it's a boy. Maybe, maybe you are an older sibling and you remember when your parents told you that you're going to have a younger brother or sister. That really changes everything, doesn't it? Well, today, Pastor John is preaching on Luke chapter 1, and there is news that Mary receives that changes everything, not just for her, but for the whole world, for you and me. This is what the angel says to Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is God, came to this earth and became man. He he put on flesh. He put on skin like you and me, and he had human experiences like you and me. He experienced sadness. He experienced happiness. And what he did as a human is he died on the cross for your sins and resurrected from the dead so that we can have eternal life in him. That is the good news. That is the news that changes the whole world and it changes everything for you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for my friends. Lord, I lift them up as they go into this Christmas season. Um, And while the gifts and celebrations are all fun, May we not be distracted from the true reason for why we celebrate Christmas, and that is because of you, Jesus, who came in the flesh to be the Savior of the world. In your name we pray, amen. You may go back to your seats or to Children's Church.
Amen. Please be seated. So we mentioned earlier and all throughout our service, today does mark the beginning of Advent. And it's a wonderful time of year. You know, some of our Scottish forebears may have rolled over in their graves at some of the things that we do, but they were doing that and maybe in response to some of the abuses that they found in the Catholic Church at that time. And I, for one, think it's good for us this time each year to slow down and to focus on the incarnation, the gift of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Advent means coming. We celebrate the first coming of Christ some 2,000 years ago. And we also long for his second coming, whenever that will be. Advent involves waiting. Jonathan Gibson in his Advent liturgy says, From the beginning of history, God calls his people to be a people waiting for the coming of his promised son. Although the longings, hopes, and expectations of the coming, conquering Son are met in Jesus' first coming, it does not change the reality that God's people are awaiting people. In other words, we look back and celebrate Christ's first coming, but we also long with anticipation and we wait for His second coming. Waiting is hard. A couple weeks ago, my four-year-old son, Bo, said, Daddy, I want to know what I'm getting for Christmas. And even after explaining to him that part of the joy of Christmas is waiting until Christmas morning to open our presents, he said, but I don't like to wait. And friends, you and I don't like to wait either, do we? Perhaps it's the long line of the drive through that we wish would go a lot faster. Or kids, it's you don't like waiting for your parents to pick you up in car line. We don't like waiting for dinner to be ready. We certainly don't like waiting for Christmas morning to be able to open our presence. In a culture of instant gratification, we don't often have to wait that much. But waiting is good for us. Waiting builds our anticipation and our longing. It causes us to reflect and to prepare. And all of that is good. My prayer is that during Advent this year, We will build anticipation in our hearts to celebrate Christ's first coming and to long with expectation for his second coming. I've entitled our Advent series, Seeing Christmas with Fresh Eyes. And we're going to look at most of Luke 1 and the early part of Luke chapter 2. You see, most of us are so familiar with the Christmas story. We've heard it a gazillion times and So because of that, we can tend to miss the beauty of what God has done in sending his son. So I challenge you to pray that God would give you fresh eyes as we look at the Christmas story in the next several weeks. Today we're in Luke 1, chapter chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. I invite you to turn with me in your Bible there, or you'll find the text printed in your bulletin insert. It also can be found in the Pew Bible on page 803. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, I'd love for you to take the one in front of you as our gift to you. Before I read this text, I'm pray and ask for the Lord's blessing and his help. Gracious God, you've told us that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Lord, would you open our eyes to see wondrous things in this, your holy word. Speak, Lord, for your servants listen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word, Luke 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. 
And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. In December of 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers were finally successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. Thrilled at their success, they telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine. We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. He glanced at it and said, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. He totally missed the big news. People had flown. Friends, in the midst of the hustle and bustle of Christmas, it's so easy for us to miss the big news. Our familiarity with this story is often to our own detriment. Here in our text, we find a gloriously frightening announcement. It's glorious because it's the announcement of the birth of the Savior of the world. It's frightening because it's an angel of the Lord showing up to Mary, who is quite unexpected about what's about to happen. As we walk through this text, let's look at this gloriously frightening announcement with fresh eyes so that we may behold the beauty of what God has done. And the first key aspect to this story, to our passage, is the promise. Look how our passage begins. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Right out of the gate, we find a historical marker, the sixth month. And that raises the question, well, the sixth month of what? Is this the sixth month of the year? Is it June? No, context tells us differently. But you see, before this, we encounter Zechariah, who's told that he and his wife Elizabeth will have a child in their old age. As we read in our text, it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And so that's the sixth month. That's the historical marker. But that raises another question. Why does Luke record this detail? Part of it is that Luke, in chapters 1 and 2, is comparing and contrasting John the Baptist and Jesus. He's showing that Jesus is greater than John. But I think there's another reason. When Luke records this kind of seemingly insignificant detail about it was a six month, he's telling us that this is a historical event. This isn't a fairy tale that Christians made up long ago, that, oh, this will be a cute Christmas celebration. We'll say that a virgin got pregnant. No, this is real history that happened in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. If if Luke had made this up, wouldn't expect Elizabeth and Zechariah to say, what? What are you talking about? No, it wasn't. Six months, that didn't happen. It's true history. And so in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth. Gabriel is only one of three angels mentioned by name in the Bible. The other two are Michael and Lucifer. And when we hear the word angel, we tend to think of kind of cute little babies with wings like Cupid at Valentine's Day. Scrap that idea completely. Angels are divine warriors sent from God. They're God's angelic messengers they are warriors of light and they're kind of scary and we don't know exactly what form gabriel takes here could mary tell that gabriel was an angel maybe the text doesn't tell us but no wonder mary is frightened as we'll see in a few minutes gabriel is sent to nazareth which is the backwoods of Galilee. Now, this isn't backwoods Chester. No, this is backwoods like Great Falls or McConnell's or Sharon or Hickory Grove. This is the kind of outskirts, the the rural part of Galilee. 
You know, God could have chosen a, an important woman from Rome or Jerusalem to be the bearer of the Christ child, but he didn't. Instead, he chose an insignificant, poor, uneducated peasant from Nazareth. And this reminds us that God often chooses unlikely people to be a part of his work in the world. You don't have to be the richest or the smartest or the best for God to use you. God uses ordinary people like you and me to accomplish his extraordinary purposes. So the call is for us to let God use us. Before we're even told this young woman's name, we're told twice that she's a virgin. And there have been some throughout church history that have denied the virgin birth. But friends, that's heresy. If we deny the virgin birth, we deny that Jesus was God. And if we deny that Jesus is God, then we have no hope of salvation. Our text tells us that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Betrothal is kind of like engagement in our day and age, except it's a little more serious, a little more formal. A couple was betrothed with a formal ceremony, which lasted about a year. To break off a betrothal required divorce. And this, during this year, the couple would not live together, and they would not be sexually active. Purity was huge for God's people. And as an aside, God's word calls us to purity today. This is not some ancient idea that should be left behind. Young people, the world will tell you that happiness is found in sexual exploration. But the Bible is clear. Sexual intimacy is to be reserved for marriage between one man and one woman. Young people waiting until they're married is less and less common. It's not popular, but it's God-honoring, and that's what matters most. And so, young people, I challenge you, if you're not married, pursue purity. Ask for God's help. Anyways, back to this passage. The virgin's name is Mary, and we must not miss the significance of the fact that her name is given. Remember, women were not seen in as important of a light as they are today. Women were kind of lower in the social totem pole at that time. And so the fact that Mary's name is even mentioned is significant. It shows us the value that God gives women as well as men. Many today assert that the Bible has oppressive views of women. Or it has a low view of women. But friends, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Just because certain offices in the church are restricted to men doesn't mean that women are of any less value than men. And so Gabriel comes to Mary and says in verse 28, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. What a greeting that is. Put yourself in Mary's shoes for a minute. An angel, whether you realize it's an angel or not, a man, who, you know, a young woman would not expect a man to come and address her, shows up and says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Oh, favored one comes from the root word for grace. It means that she's been given God's grace. Gabriel will explain more about that in a minute. We need to be clear here. Gabriel doesn't say that Mary is full of grace. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary is full of grace and is able to dispense that grace to other people. That's why Catholics say, Hail Mary. But that makes her the source of grace rather than the object of grace. And Mary, like all of us, is simply an object of God's grace. Well, Mary, understandably, is greatly troubled at this saying, verse 29 tells us. Mary is a young girl, more than likely between the ages of 15 and 17, but some scholars think she could be as young as 12. In other words, she's probably a teenage peasant to whom an angel appears saying that she's a favored individual. Yeah, that's a little frightening. But Gabriel responds in such a gentle way. Look at verse 30. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Angels are God's messengers. And as such, they represent not just the message of God, but also the character of God. And how Gabriel responds to Mary is so important. The compassion, the tenderness, the love, the goodness is a picture of the goodness 
of God. Do you believe that God is good? In the midst of life in a broken, fallen, and sinful world, it's easy for us to kind of doubt his goodness. Yeah, sure, God is good to the family that has everything together, but what about you and me? Is God really good to the family who's about to lose a loved one to cancer? Is God really good to the family whose children keep getting sick? Is he really good to the family whose father just lost his job? We can struggle to believe that God is good. But friends, he is. And over and over again in Scripture, we find the message that God is good. So don't forget his goodness. Rest in his goodness. Now let's think about what Gabriel says to Mary for a minute. He says, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The name Jesus means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. And from the beginning, from even before his conception, we see that the mission of Jesus was about salvation. Someone once said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us the Savior. That's powerful. Our greatest need is forgiveness, and so God sent us a Savior. Jesus didn't come to be an inspiration. He didn't come to be a good example. No, he came to save. His name means Yahweh, the Lord, saves. And he's saved by going to the cross. Not only is his name Jesus, but he will be great and be called Son of the Most High. Great is the term used in Bible for God alone. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. So the promise is that his baby is God. He is the Son of the Most High. He is the eternal Son of God who took on human nature like ours. And he will be the king. Last week we saw how the book of Amos ended with the promise that the, that the booth of David would be restored. It was a prophecy about the kingdom of God and the king who would one day come. And that king was Jesus. And here we see the fulfillment of that. He will be king forever. His kingdom shall not end. Jesus is king right now, and he will be king for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, the promise that God makes through the angel Gabriel here is amazing. It's glorious, and it's world-changing. Well, that's the promise, but we also see in our text the power, the power behind the promise. Mary is obviously concerned about all this. Look at verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Mary may be young, but she's not dumb. She knew enough about human reproduction to know that as a a virgin, having a child is impossible, humanly speaking. But notice her question. She asked, how will this be? She doesn't ask how can this be, but she asks how will this be, and the difference of will and can is important, because when she says how will this be, she's showing that she believes that God can and do what he said he will do. She may have been an uneducated peasant, but her theology is good enough to know that God can do even the unthinkable. Prior to our passage, we find a man named Zechariah who was told that he'll have a son, to John the Baptist. And in Luke 1.18, he asked, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. He approaches it from a point of doubt, speculation. He asks for a sign, and the sign that's given him is that he will not be able to speak until the birth of the child. But Mary humbly accepts what God says. Yet she wonders how God will do this. She knows he can and he will, but her curiosity is, is how? And so God graciously answers. He doesn't tell her everything. 
Mary couldn't have handled everything, just like we can't handle everything. And so God tells us what we need to know. Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. There it is. How will this young virgin have a child? It's the power of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is unprecedented in human history. In Greek mythology, you find myths about the gods coming down and having sexual relations with women. But this is not that. This is not some R-rated movie scene. No, this is the power of God on full display. The Holy Spirit has always been involved in the work of creation. Think back to the very beginning, to Genesis 1, when God created the world. In Genesis 1, 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the creative God who created the world in Genesis 1 is now here at work in another creation of life in a virgin's womb. But this is a remarkable work of creation because it's taking the eternal Son of God and bringing him down into the womb of a teenage Galilean girl. This is nothing short of a miracle. Only God could do something as wondrous as this. Are you amazed at what God did in sending his son? Or are you so familiar with this passage that you've kind of lost the power of what God has done? I pray that you see the power of God with fresh eyes. And it's important because that same power of God that was at work in giving conception to a virgin Some 2,000 years ago, that same power is at work in the world today. Perhaps you're struggling with infertility. Do you really believe that God has the power to open your womb? Maybe you're grieving the loss of a parent or a spouse or a child. Can you dare to believe that the power of God can give you joy this Christmas season? Perhaps you have a child that has wandered far from the Lord. Do you believe that the power of God can bring him or her back to Christ? Maybe you're facing some serious health concern. Do you believe that God's power can actually heal you and that God really does care about you? The power of God is not magic. You can't conjure it up by good works or by saying the right things, but you can pray big prayers to a big God. He can handle lots of requests. He doesn't have bigger fish to fry, so to speak. He cares about you. Gabriel closes his words in a powerful way. Look at verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's a powerful verse. That's a a verse that you can build your life upon. It's similar to what God tells Abraham when he's told that his wife Sarah will have a child. Genesis 18, 14, the Lord asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing will be impossible with God. Does this mean that you can climb a mountain? Not necessarily. Kids, does that mean that you're going to be a professional athlete? Probably not. But no matter what you face, if your faith is in Christ, the power of God is at work for your good and for his glory. And that will give you strength to face tomorrow. That will get you through the hard days. And that will carry you home to glory. We've seen the promise, the power, and now lastly the response. How does Mary respond? Look at verse 38. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow. Just wow. Teenagers, could you imagine responding to a life-altering announcement with words like that? Can any of us imagine responding like that? Let's think about this for a minute. Mary is a teenager betrothed to Joseph. Being pregnant would have opened her up to all sorts of speculation, to ridicule, to accusations and gossip. She would have probably been labeled an immoral woman. And it would have impacted her relationship with Joseph. Remember, Matthew's gospel tells us that Joseph planned to divorce her quietly. The announcement that Gabriel brought to an unsuspecting Mary would have rocked her world. Pregnancy is hard physically. I know all you moms out there are saying, John, you have no idea. And you're right, I don't. But it's hard. Emotionally, physically, socially, in all the ways. 
And for Mary, it would have been very difficult. But Mary doesn't balk at the idea of what the angel Gabriel says. Think about how many characters in the Bible try to weasel their way out of what God asked them to do. Moses, go speak to Pharaoh. But God, I'm not very eloquent. Choose somebody else. Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. I don't want to watch you save those people. I'm going to get on a ship and go the opposite direction. Peter denied Jesus three times the night that he was betrayed. There's plenty more examples in Scripture, people trying to get out of what God has called them to do. But that's not what Mary does. Instead, she humbly submits to the will of God. She says she is the Lord's servant. Literally, it means that she is the Lord's slave. Talk about humility. Talk about trust. Talk about obedience. This is truly amazing. Now, certainly, we don't want to put Mary on a pedestal. She is a sinner just like the rest of us. She needed God's grace like we all do. But she did respond in a remarkable manner. How is this possible? Ultimately, it was God's work in her, God giving her the faith. But part of her faith came from the fact that she knew and could experience the goodness of God. She had tasted and seen that the Lord is good, as Psalm 34, 8 commands. God had been so kind and compassionate to her. And if that kind of God was her God, then she could trust him. A God that good warrants such humble submission. Think of the closing line to the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Have you experienced the goodness of God? Now, yes, we all have in general terms. God is good to all all of us. But have you really experienced God's goodness? Have you slowed down to take time to realize how good God has been to you and to your family and to this church? And if so, can you repeat the words of Mary? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Can you say that and mean it? Even if it means being called as a missionary to another country even if it means finding a different job so that you have more time with your family, even if it means breaking up with a boyfriend or girlfriend who doesn't know and love Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this passage is remarkable. A gloriously frightening announcement. A better announcement than which four teams will make the college football playoff. I pray that you have been able to see this passage with fresh eyes. I pray the promise of the birth of Christ warms your heart. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit emboldens your faith. And I pray that Mary's response inspires you to respond in like manner. Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Let us delight in the birth of our Savior. Let us long for his second coming. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for a passage like this that reminds us of what you have done for us. Lord, I pray that we would indeed see it with fresh eyes. That we would remember the great lengths you went to save us by sending your son to be born of the Virgin Mary. Lord, I pray that that would warm our hearts, that it would inspire us to respond like Mary. And Lord, would we believe your power? She really can do amazing things in our lives the lives of our children and grandchildren. Lord, you can do great things in this church, and you have for so many years. We ask that you will continue to do that. Lord, we thank you for all the visitors that you have brought us. Would you continue to bring more, and would we be faithful to invite people to church, to tell people the good news of Christ? And would we see revival here in our town, and would it spread across the world? Lord, we do pray for those that are facing challenges. We pray... For Angela Fishester, Lord, I pray for peace and for strength for each day for her and for Chris and her family. Lord, I pray for Mardell Nashon as she is a close to going home to glory. Lord, I pray that you would just give her strength and give her peace. Lord, I give you praise for the successful surgeries for Mary Robinson and for Stephen Turner, for Michelle Harbin. Lord, would you help each of these to continue to recover, to make good progress. Lord, for others facing challenges, would you provide as only you can? Lord, would you uh, bless our church, bless our outreach ministries of athletics, the basketball season coming up? Would it be a time 
not just a fun athleticism, but Lord, would it also be a chance for discipleship and outreach, that our kids would come to know you and love you more, and for their friends that are playing on teams, would they hear the good news of Jesus? Lord, for our preschool, would you bless that ministry? For just joy, would you be at work in the special needs community? Lord, would you provide as only you can? Lord, you are so good to us. We love you, we trust you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We do want to affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find them printed in your bulletin. If you're able, please stand with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of dedication is number 152 in your hymnal. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, number 152. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that God is at work in this world. He's chosen to use this church, which means you and I have a part to play. So go and play your part. Play it faithfully and play it with the blessing of God as we go out from this place. Receive now the benediction. Jesus said in this world you will face tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of his spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.